so uh, welcome today. Um, is the sound on this? Yes. OK, good. So my name is Brett Lee. I'm the mayor of Davis. And on behalf of my colleagues on the city council and the city of Davis, I would like to welcome you to the 25th celebration of Martin Luther King, uh, the city of Davis' 25th celebration. Uh, this event is made possible through the hard work of the Davis Human Relations Commission and the, the kind sponsorship by the Davis uh, Varsity Theater. And also, uh, we'd like to thank Davis Media Access for uh, filming this event. So my comments are very brief. Uh, we have a, a very full program of uh, a lot of interesting and entertaining events for you. I just want to say that there have, are very, very many paths that have brought us here today. So as you look around and the, the people in the audience, you know, how we arrived here today to celebrate this important day, um, all these paths are very different. And as we leave today, our paths that we take will also be very different. But I think we can all agree that Dr. King's work remains unfinished. That he was involved in so many things, in so many areas, that we still have much work to do. And so I just really want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to come and celebrate this person and also to celebrate the day. And I hope that this program helps inspire you to continue his work. Thank you. And And joining me up on the stage will be Elizabeth Mosley, who will be uh, conducting uh, the rest of the, the introductions. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Lee. I'm Elizabeth Mosley, and I'm a member of the Human Relations Commission. The Human Relations Commission promotes mutual respect, understanding, and tolerance among all persons. The commission seeks to build a community where relationships among diverse peoples are valued by all. Discrimination and hate are not tolerated. The voices of the voiceless are heard and where citizens can address issues dealing with hatred, discrimination and alienation through education, outreach, studies and recommendations to the city council. We like to recognize and thank some of our members of the community, our, our mayor, Brett Lee, our Mayor Pro Tem, Gloria Partita, other city officials and state officials council members, Lucas Frericks and Dan Carson, Assembly Member Cecilia Aguiar Curry, Supervisor Don Saylor, County Assessor Jesse Salinas, School Board Member Joe Denuzio. Thank you so much for being here today. Please now join me in welcoming the City of Davis Poet Laureate, John, James Lee Job. James Lee Job is the fourth Poet Laureate of Davis, California. He hosts two ongoing poetry series in Davis and teaches a poetry workshop. Among his five chapbooks are What God Said When She Finally Answered Me from Rattlesnake Press. Job's poems have been published in magazines, journals, and anthologies across several decades. And he's on the board of directors of a homeless shelter here in Davis. Thank you. Mommy. Thank you very much. To live in Davis is to live in a very diverse community, and that's one of the biggest blessings of it. Thank you all for coming out today. This poem is an original poem I uh, wrote just for this occasion uh, for Dr. King. It's called Keeping the Faith, and it begins with a quote from Dr. King that I like a lot. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. You need to keep going. When injustice covers the land like a dust storm, we must keep the faith, for the air will clear again one day. When the leaders rule with lies and fear, we must keep the faith, 
for the truth will come out. We are weary from our labor, but we must keep the faith and not compromise our beliefs. Only in such a compromise is our faith in danger. Stay strong at heart. Keep the faith. Those who separate us by the color of our skin will yet fail. Those who separate us by whom we love will yet fail. Those who lock a child in a cage may seem strong, but they're weak. Stay strong at heart. Keep the faith. Those who would rape the planet for a few dollars will die without the peace that money cannot buy. Those who would keep us in endless war for profit will die without a ticket into heaven. Stay strong at heart. Keep the faith. There is a long way to go, but we've gone too far to turn back. Keep the faith. Those who rule now later will fall. Keep the faith. Free the jailed. Feed the hungry. Keep the faith. Level the field of challenge, the field of privilege. Keep the faith. The cruel have not won. The end is not in sight. Keep the faith. Stay strong. The power of honesty is with us. Keep the faith. The power of the righteous is with us. Keep the faith. Do not falter because there are still miles to walk. Do not falter because those who hate have again awakened. Keep the faith. Stay strong. As long as even one person is left behind, keep the faith. As long as even one person suffers for being different, keep the faith. We must keep the faith. We must stay strong. For as long as even one person is less than, equality does not yet exist. Keep the faith. Stay strong. Keep the faith. Thank you. Thank you, James, for that. That was wonderful. I'd like to introduce children of the parents of African-American children Davis. PACT is a social group that brings together parents, caregivers, and kids for friendship, support, and fun. They welcome working and at-home parents and caregivers to join, the, to join and build lasting friendships, create a supportive community, grow together with our children, and celebrate our African-American culture and heritage. Families from all neighboring communities are welcome. The children of PACT are going to read a poem titled, One Today by Richard Blanco. This poem was written for Barack Obama's second presidential inauguration on January 21st, 2013. One sun rose on us today, kindled over our shores, peeking over the smokies, greeting the faces of the great lakes. Spreading a simple truth across the Great Plains, then charging across the Rockies. One light waking up rooftops under each one. A story t told by a silent justice moving behind windows. My face, your face. Millions of faces in morning mirrors, each one yawning to life, crescendoing into our day. Pencil yellow school buses, the rhythm of traffic, the rhythm of traffic lights, fruit stands, apples, limes, and oranges, or like rainbows begging our praise. Silver, tr silver trucks, heavy with oil or paper, bricks or milk, teaming over highways alongside us on our way to clean tables, read ledgers, or save lives. To teach geometry, or ring up groceries as my mother did for 20 years so I could write this poem. All of us is vital as the one light we move through. The same light on blackboards with lessons for the day, equations to solve, history to question, or atoms imagined. 
I have a dream, we keep dreaming, or the impossible vocabulary of sorrow that won't explain the empty desks of 20 children, all marked absent, today and forever. Many prayers but one night, breathing color into stained glass windows, life into the faces of bronze statues, warmth onto the steps of our museums, and park benches as mothers watch children slide into the day. One ground, our ground, rooting as to every stalk of corn, every head of wheat sown by sweat and hands, hands gleaning coal or planting windmills in deserts and hilltops that keep us warm. Hands digging trenches, routing pipes and cables. Hands as worn as my father's cutting sugar cane, so my brother and I can have books and shoes. The dust of farms and desert cities and plains, mingled by one breath, one wind, our breath. Breathe, hear it through the days. Uh, okay. Um, Bree, uh, gorgeous stands of honking cabs, buses launching down avenues, the symphony of footsteps, guitars, and screeching subways, the unexpected songbird on your clothesline. Here, here is squeaky playground swings, trains whistling or whispers across cafe tables. Here, here are the doors we open for each other all day, saying hello, shalom, buon grano. Howdy, namaste, or buenos dias. In the language my mother taught me in every language spoken into one wind carrying our lives without prejudice as these words break from my lips. One sky, since the Appalachians and Sierras claimed their majesty and the Mississippi and Colorado worked their way to the sea, Thank the work of our hands, weaving steel into bridges, finishing one more report for the boss on time, stitching another wound or uniform, the first brush stroke on a portrait, or the last floor on the Freedom Tower, jetting into a sky that yields to our resilience. One sky toward which we sometimes lift our eyes, tired from work, some days guessing at the weather of our lives, some days giving thanks for a love that loves you back, sometimes praising a mother who knew how to give or forgiving a father who couldn't give what you wanted. We head home through the gloss of rain or weight of snow or the plum blush of dusk, but always home, always under one sky, our sky, and always one moon, like a silent drum tapping on every rooftop and every window of one country, all of us, facing the stars, waiting for us to map it, waiting for us to name it together. Thank you to the PAC children for such a great job with that. I'd now like to welcome Gabriel Patterson. Gabriel Patterson is not a city person. He grew up in rural Santa Fe, New Mexico, where there were no cell phones, and his father was the local pediatrician. From ages 8 to 13, he was a cowboy. His childhood was spent outdoors, branding and herding for a nearby ranch. As he grew older, his love of the outdoors transformed into a passion for science. He's currently a PhD candidate in agriculture and environmental chemistry at UC Davis. 
He knew from a young age that his interests were perceived by others to be, at worst, not black enough, and at best, simply going against the grain. At the same time, he felt the internal pressure to demonstrate that black men aren't defined by the one-dimensional negative portrayals seen in the media. Patterson recently started a POC climbing group called Soul Ascension Crew. The organization hosts rock climbing nights in order to promote diverse groups in climbing, bring in new people, and create community and representation. Gabriel. Hello, my name is Gabriel Patterson. Um, I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, like it was said, so I was born and raised in Santa Fe. I spent a lot of my early years doing cattle ranching in southern Colorado. Um, I'm 6'2", um, I'm tall. People have always thought I played basketball or football, but I grew up playing ice hockey. And my two older brothers, they're twins, they're 29. I'm age 27. And um, for three years in high school, we were on all state champion teams as ice hockey players. Um, I grew up playing soccer. And in undergrad in Colorado, I got into rock climbing and yoga, and I've been climbing since 2009. And um, have always felt like I've been the only person in these, in these scenes, whether in, a, in academia, here doing my PhD, or in a yoga studio in town, or at a climbing gym in Sacramento. And so I'm here to talk to you about what I'm doing um, in my communities and um, a little bit about something called Melanin Base Camp, MBC. You can find them on Instagram or um, on the internet, melaninbasecamp.com. And they highlight people of color in the outdoors doing rock climbing, skydiving, whatever it be, um, to show that these people are out there, that there is representation that not all of us um, are sticking to like a stereotypical kind of path. So, um, Melanin Base Camp, I encourage you all to go check it out. Um, they do daily articles about POC and outdoors. They post daily photos. Um, these photos of myself are in South Lake Tahoe, by the way. Um, Let's see, so Melanie Base Camp not only highlight, highlights POC, but also queer communities in, in outdoor adventure and activities. So in, in June of 2018, I started Soul Ascension Crew, um, the idea being to support new climbers and existing climbers of color to um, show that we're here, so representation, to build community, and to bring in new people. And so we've been working out of Sacramento Pipeworks. And here's some photos from our events. Um, most recently, last Friday, we've reached out to the Boys and Girls Club and we brought in um, about 10 students from Sacramento from the Boys and Girls Club and had a climbing event with them. So it's not just people my age or undergrad, um, but also um, youth. So there's a lot of teaching, teaching people how to climb, teaching the safety, um, all the above. Some more photos. Um, I've got this friend, Monkey, Chinese American. And when I first met him, he thought that people of color was limited to, to black people, that I meant colored people. And so I kind of had a funny interaction with him saying, no, people of color encompasses all people identifying as a person of color. So it's for, it's for everyone. So more photos. Um, and so this is coming from Melanin Base Camp. They, a number of their articles kind of discuss like this person's experience in these environments, um, what it's like to be the only one climbing, or um, what their experiences are in nature, et cetera. So here's just a couple screenshots I took of the different articles. Um, on the far right is the article that I was featured in. Um, and yeah, a number of other ones as well. So that kind of wraps up what I'm presenting, but I want to leave you with some resources. Um, one of my favorite books to this day is called The Adventure Gap. It talks about this gap between communities of color and the outdoors. And so the book follows and documents the first all-black expedition of Denali in, in Alaska. 
And um, with that, there's a film that followed called The American Ascent, which you can watch on Vimeo, I believe. Um, and there's my email if you want to contact me with further questions um, to stay in the loop with our meetups. I would be happy to hear from you. That is all. Thank you, Gabriel. That was very interesting, actually. Please join me in welcoming Afro Vibes to the stage. Welcome. Afro Vibes is a multicultural dance group that focuses on African, Afro-Caribbean cultural and artistic traditions through a diverse range of modern and contemporary African music and dance forms. The goal of this organization is to demonstrate both the similarities and differences between the rich cultures within the African diaspora while catering to diverse identities on campus. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Afro Vibes, for that great performance. Thank you. I now have the privilege of introducing our speaker, Cynthia Pickett. Her presentation is titled, Teaching Our Kids to Talk About Race and the Dangers of Colorblind Ideology. Cynthia Pickett completed her PhD at Ohio, at Ohio State University and her undergraduate studies at Stanford University. In addition to her academic appointment as an associate professor of psychology at UC Davis, Pickett is director of UC Davis's Self and Social Identity Lab. Professor Pickett also serves as the associate vice provost for faculty equity and inclusion at UC Davis. Pickett is a member of several professional societies, including the Society of Experimental Social Psychology and the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, where she serves on the board of directors as the member at large for education. Pickett was recently elected at a four-year term on the Board of Education of the Davis Joint Unified School District. Please join me in welcoming Cynthia Pickett to the stage. do that. All right. Good morning and thank you uh, for coming out to celebrate the life, achievements, and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thanks also to the City of Davis Human Relations Commission for inviting me to speak. I am truly honored uh, to be before you today. Let's, this is going to move. So on August 28, 1963, Dr. King gave his Eye of a Dream speech at the March on Washington. In that speech, he said these famous words, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. These were very hopeful and inspiring words, but in the end, they were King's dream, not his reality, and not our reality as a nation. Instead, indeed, King often spoke about our nation, our divided nation as being two Americas. One America characterized by prosperity and opportunity, and the other characterized by poverty and racism. King called upon us to recognize these two Americas and not be blinded to the fact that skin color very much determines how one's treated in this country. In a speech at Gross Point High School in March of 1968, King addressed the audience by saying, the first thing I would like to mention is that there must be a recognition on the part of everybody in this nation that America is still a racist country. Now, however unpleasant that sounds, it is the truth. And we will never solve the problem of racism until there is a recognition of the fact that racism still stands at the center of so much of our nation. Although King wrote these words just over 50 years ago, all of us are reminded daily of the fact that racism still exists in our country. So how do we advance the dream of living in a society free from discrimination and injustice where we can truly be judged by the content of their character? I will argue here today that there are two very important steps that we need to take. First, we need to be willing to have conversations about race, even when those conversations are difficult or uncomfortable. We cannot stay in the safe space of silence. To do so is to perpetuate the conditions of the other America. Second, we need to pass on this ability to the next generation. We need to give our children tools to be able to talk about race so that they can address issues of racism, discrimination, and injustice when those issues arise. Now, at this point, um, many of you might be unconvinced that this is the path forward. You might be thinking to yourself, but doesn't drawing attention to race make racism worse? <clears throat> you might also be thinking that your own children rarely notice race and that they don't harbor racial biases. If you'll bear with me, I will present research showing that both of these ideas are sadly incorrect. And an openness to discussing race is a better way forward. So let's start with the question of whether children are colorblind. The answer from decades of research, both in psychology and, social, and sociology, is a resounding no. Study after study has demonstrated that children recognize race from a very early age, 
for a very early age. And in addition, racial biases emerge among both majority and minority groups um, by ages three to five. And again, you might be tempted personally to think your children won't develop racial biases because you have not taught your children to be racist. Unfortunately, racism does not have to be directly taught. Children perceive and conform to societal norms and the messages they get from the broader community. They notice racial disparities. They notice who lives in the big houses versus the apartments, who has the high paying jobs versus the low paying jobs, who is granted respect and who isn't. So if children notice race and have begun to develop racial biases around race, what are parents doing to address this? Well, it depends. Parents of minority children in the US have actually been shown to talk about race and ethnicity quite regularly. But what is happening in the white households? In a recent study of white American mothers of children aged four to seven years old, the researchers investigated how mothers in the study talked about race with their children. The results indicated that most mothers took a colorblind or color mute approach, 70% compared to 30% who took a color-conscious approach. Now, when, when these mothers were asked by the researchers why they did this, many of the mothers indicated that they presumed their silence would lead their children to not notice differences and thus remain unbiased. Unfortunately, as I previously stated, that's not how it works. Children do notice race, and all parents have done by avoiding a discussion is to turn race into the elephant in the room. Now, to make matters worse, the silence of parents also silences their children. In one study, elementary school children were asked to play a game with the experimenter, where they were presented with images of two different individuals. So if you look at the, the top half of the panel, right, and they the, the children had to ask questions to determine which of these two images was on the card that the experimenter was holding. In the race-relevant condition, the two images were always of individuals of different races. In the race-neutral condition, the two individuals were of the same race. Now, the goal of the game was to identify the person on the experimenter's card by asking the fewest number of questions um, possible. So in the race-relevant condition, as you can see the top panel, the most expedient way to do this is to ask a question about race. Is the person white? Is the person black? However, when you look at the data, what you see is that by age, ages 10 and 11, children have started to avoid mentioning race. And in fact, the 10 and 11-year-olds are doing worse than the eight and nine-year-olds because the 10 and 11-year-olds aren't ra asking the very obvious race question. In short, these children have been socialized to believe that talking about race is socially inappropriate. And this is happening both at home and at school. So there was a follow-up study um, by a different, I think, group of researchers um, where they um, once again used this experimental game. And they looked at um, the, the extent to which parents talked about race and the extent to which the, the children's teachers talked about race. And what they found is that to the extent that, or to the extent that parents and teachers avoid race, the children also avoid, avoided talking about race. All right, so it has an overall chilling effect in terms of this discussion or what's, what is seen as good or bad to talk about. All right, so why does this matter? Um, I argue that this matters because colorblindness, so not seeing or acknowledging race, and color muteness, which is not talking about race, have been shown to magnify racial bias, diminish concern for intergroup equality, reduce the recognition of racial discrimination, and stifle discussions of racism and social injustice. So in one study by Jennifer Richardson and Richard Nussbaum, study participants were randomly assigned, and these study participants um, in the study were college students, but they were randomly assigned to one of two experimental conditions. All right, in the multiculturalism condition, participants were asked to read the following statement. 
Intergroup harmony can be achieved if we better appreciate our diversity and recognize and accept each group's positive and negative qualities. All right, so that's the multicultural approach to talking about race. By contrast, in the colorblind condition, participants read, intergroup harmony can be achieved if we recognize that at our core we are all the same, that all men and women are created equal, and that we are first and foremost a nation of individuals. Now, on its surface, the colorblind approach seems promising, and at the very worst, harmless. However, when these researchers assess levels of racial bias immediately following um, these, these statements, they found that subjects in the multicultural condition, sorry, in the colorblind condition, exhibited more racial bias, both overt and covert racial bias, compared to subjects in the multicultural condition. All right, so you might be scratching your head, saying, well, why is this the case? Well, let's read between the lines. If we buy the idea that we are truly all the same, and first and foremost a nation of individuals, then any differences in the outcomes we attain must be due to our individual achievements or failures. Within this ideological framework, it is okay to have negative feelings about individuals who are living in poverty or failing in school because it, assume, it's, it is assumed that they have brought it upon themselves. Thus, colorblind ideology not only blinds individuals to race, but it also blinds them to discrimination. In a demonstration of this, elementary age children were randomly assigned to either receive a lesson about colorblindness or a lesson about multiculturalism, much like we saw before. These children then, saw a, then read a series of vignettes describing interactions between a black child and a white child. In some of the vignettes, the black child ex experienced ambiguous discrimination, whereas in others, the black child experienced more blatant discrimination. So for example, in the ambiguous condition, the children read, most of Brady's classmates got invitations, but Terry was one of the kids that did not. Brady decided not to invite him because he knew that Terry would not be able to buy him any of the presents on his wish list. Now in the explicit discrimination condition, um, the children read, Max tripped Derek from behind and took the ball. When one of Max's teammates asked him about the final play, Max said that he could tell that Derek played rough because he was black. The children exposed, as the, sorry, in the study, the children who were exposed to colorblind mindsets were then later on less likely to view both ambiguous and blatantly racist race-biased events as discrimination. All right, so simply thinking in terms of a colorblind ideology led to the, a lower likelihood of seeing discrimination when it's potentially out there. Now what was also really interesting about this study is that the experimenters had the children describe these events um, in their own words and then recorded them describing these events. And um, then they then, they then got a sample of certified teachers to listen to the children's descriptions and then indicate whether they, the teachers, thought that the incident warranted teacher intervention. The descriptions provided by children in the colorblind condition prompted less teacher intervention than the descriptions given by children in the multicultural condition. When children fail to see race, they fail to detect discrimination. And the kicker is that they also fail to elicit the response from others needed to address the discrimination or injustice. What all this suggests is that to empower our children to make a difference in the future, we need to allow them to find their voice. And the key to that is changing our behavior and the conversations that we are willing to have. And I contend that this may be particularly important for minority children. Now the dilemma that minority children face is that at the same time that they are facing the critical years of racial identity development, they are also socialized, as I showed previously, to not talk about race, particularly in predominantly white environments. This can hamper their ability to affect change and enlist allies. So this was a study done in Canada by um, Jackie Vorauer and her, and her colleagues. And what they did is they had white and indigenous college students, um, they brought them together in pairs, dyads, to talk about social issues. 
the indigenous member of the dyad was randomly assigned to read an anti-racist, colorblind, or multicultural message before the discussion. Now, and the primary outcome measure was the extent to which uh, the white member of the dyad conformed to the views of the indigenous participant. All right, so the results indicated that the indigenous participant was able to express his or her own point of view more clearly and more directly when multicultural ideologies was made salient to them compared to the colorblind and control conditions. So put simply, recognizing and appreciating racial differences empowers minority group members to address the issues that are very real to them. And this then has a positive effect in terms of engaging majority group members. So putting this all together, where do we go from here? All right, so as a community, I would like to challenge and encourage all of us to do the following. So one, do not shut down the conversation. Young children have many questions about race. Um, they might ask why the black child in their class has such curly hair, or why the eyes of Asian children look different. When these questions arise, it can cause discomfort or embarrassment. I remember when my daughter was about six years old, um, we were in the cereal aisle at the Nugget, and she saw her first box of cream of wheat. Right. Upon discovering the box, she then proceeded to loudly exclaim, uh, "For all those into the, you know, all those in the aisle, it's Obama!" Um, now, confusing one member of a racial category with another is actually a well-documented psychological error. Um, but in that situation, my worry about what the other shoppers might think caused me to quiet her and move quickly on with my shopping. Right? We need to not do this. All right? We have to stop doing this. Instead, oh, we don't want that. Um, instead, we need to engage in open, honest, frequent, and age-appropriate conversations about race, racial differences, and even racial inequality, inequity, and racism. And I'd like to emphasize the word frequent. It can't just be something we do on MLK Day. Right? It has to be part of our everyday experience. Third, we need to let go of the notion that one is putting ideas in their head by talking about race, right? The ideas are already there, even if the children aren't talking about it. Fourth, we need to avoid dumbing down the conversation. So what this means is we need to avoid superficial multicultural education that focus only on celebrations of culture and individual heroes and leaves out any discussion of structural inequities, right? So talking about inequities, it's a complicated uh, framing sometimes, but it's really important in terms of giving children that deeper understanding about how racism and discrimination and injustice exist in our society. And the fifth point, um, and this is one I think I feel the most strongly about, is that we have to take instances of prejudice seriously. And there is, I've seen this in Davis in many ways, in many um, outlets, where um, it, it's brushed off, right? But if name calling or other discrimination happens at school or on the playground, and then goes either unnoticed or is not discussed by adults, children infer that the behavior is widely accepted, right? So they are, they are learning from our behavior, and we have to ask ourselves, is this what we want them to learn? So it is my hope that together as a community, we can work on these goals, and that we may one day reach the promised land of which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so fondly spoke. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for that. That was very, very interesting discussion around talking about colorblindness and, and the reasons why. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Minga and her children to sing for us. 
Natalie Mia Mukome is the director of Tese Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit serving high school students in Zimbabwe. Her mission is to alleviate poverty from the girl child through tuition, uniforms, personal hygiene packs, and exam fees. In the U.S., where she currently resides, she has mobilized her local community to participate in fundraising efforts through her popular annual Women and Girls Tea, which is now in its fourth year and held every November. Locally, she's a very active member of her community, a member of the Davis Sunrise Rotary, a court-appointed special advocate for youth in foster care, and a past International House Davis Board of Directors member. Apart from being a community organizer, Natalie is also a busy mother of three and a designer at African Print by Natalie. She truly believes in the concept of Tesse Foundation. It takes a village. Please join me in welcoming Natalie. Actually. You can come. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you. This is, we've been in Davis 10 years, and this is probably my, I don't know, seventh year attending MLK Day. And it's a really inspiring time that I don't take for granted. Um, and uh, I, I just really appreciate the time that we spend here. I know she's very distracting. <laughs> Cute. Um, so I was asked to sing a song. And uh, I'm going to sing a spiritual, you know, we here we reference them as Negro spirituals, you know, born and raised in Africa, we call them gospel hymns. And um, the music is not just songs. It really is weapons of opposition um, that we've used from generation to generation, from my ancestors Mbuya Nehanda and Sekuru Kagu in Zimbabwe to the famous Shaka the Zulu. You kids read up about Shaka the Zulu. He was pretty a bad, you know person. <laughs> I wanted to put the A word, but no, this kid. So we, I want you to look at the songs as more than just songs. If we go even up, you know, down to South Africa during the apartheid era, you heard them sing these powerful songs of call and response. And then we go to the cotton fields here in the South. You, people would survive the harsh conditions of the cotton fields with these uh, gospel hymns. And then during the Underground Railroad, I don't know how many of you knew that people used hymns and these gospel spirituals to hide maps and routes to escape the underground with the Underground Railroad. Hold on. And um, as we go forward during the civil rights movement, Jim Crow, so these are really important. And we want to pass that down to our next generation. And it's really fitting that this year it's about empowering and uplifting, and uplifting the next generation. So I, I brought reinforcements. One is here already. The other two join me. And we really want to inspire our next generation. So it's really important for me that I always teach them these songs so that they already know and they grow up knowing um, the history. We all know that if we don't know our history, we'll soon repeat it. And we hope that these songs they will use as just soothing their spirits and hopefully not for more weapons of opposition. She's ready. <laughs> All right. You ready? King Jesus is Lord. King Jesus is Lord. My only Lord. My only Lord. I know your answers. He's walking by my side, walking by my side, and I'm satisfied. And I'm satisfied. King Jesus is Lord. King Jesus is Lord. My only Lord. My only Lord. My only Lord. I know He'll answer when I call. Me when I call. And I'm satisfied. King Jesus is Lord. King Jesus is Lord. My only Lord. My only Lord. I know He'll answer. I know He'll answer me when I call. Me when I call. He's walking by my side. He's walking by my side. 
buy it, buy it, buy it, and I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. King Jesus is Lord, my only Lord, my only Lord. Now it's your turn. It's your turn. Mommy, it's your turn. It's your turn. No. Okay. I know he answer. I know he'll answer. Me when I go. Me when I go. He's walking by my side. He's walking by my side. I said, I'm satisfied. And I'm satisfied. King Jesus is Lord. My only Lord. King. My only Lord. My only Lord. King Jesus is Lord. My only <laughs> and then you will hear Judah and Tania share their own I Have a Dream speeches. And Tia. <laughs> I have a dream that I will soon be mayor. When I soon be mayor, I will rule Davis and I will make sure you have no harm in your city. I have a dream that I will soon go around the world and help people in need. I have a dream that all kids of all colors will soon play together. I have a dream that the hospitals will be free for everyone. I have a dream that Martin Luther King will just come and save us all. I have a dream that us kids will be able to vote because you guys real messed it up. <laughs> I have a dream that we will all just love each other. I have a dream that we'll all be free. Maybe next year. Chi Chi, what's your dream? My dream is I go to my dream is brother. Yes, I go to my castle. I get, I go to Vanier. <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Natalie and children. That was very entertaining, <laughs> very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. I love those dreams, too. Wonderful. We're going to conclude our program today with music played by the ever-popular Davis Freedom Singers. When they're done, everyone is encouraged to participate in a short freedom march throughout downtown Davis. The march will conclude at the East Street Plaza. Thank you so much to each and all of you for joining us today to celebrate diversity. Yes, thank you. Let us all work together to end discrimination in all its forms and to live the legacy that Dr. King left us. Thank you so much. It works, I think, is the way to do it. We got these are we, we everybody's really a freedom singer, so anyone that wants to come up and sing with us, please, please do. And Ron, you get down the other end here, Ron. Come over here. 
So we're just going to sing a couple of freedom songs that, uh, that were sung in the South during the marches, from, particularly the one from Selma to Montgomery. And uh, there's not very many of us left that went on that march. Sadly. Yeah, well, it's because we're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> but better. Carol, what's the first song? Uh, this is a little line of mine. Okay. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to make it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Free from fear and hatred, I'm going to let it shine. Free from fear and hatred, I'm going to let it shine. Free from fear and hatred, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. Oh, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All around the world. All around the world. I'm going to let it shine. All around the world. I'm going to let it shine. All around the world. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right, okay. So let's all stand up and sing, We Shall Overcome. I think that would be a good thing to do. We shall overcome, you know. It's not going to carry on like this. We have to, but we have to get out and vote, right? Let the kids vote. Yep, the kids vote. Yeah, the kids will do it. Okay, start it. Oh, it's in the key of C. Ooh, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. Oh, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I shall believe that we shall overcome someday. Oh, we'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. Someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I shall believe that we shall overcome. Someday we shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep in my heart. I 
I shall be thee, that we shall overcome someday. What's the last verse in that song? We are, we are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone today. Oh, deep in my heart, I do. That we shall overcome someday. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna sing a song on my way, and we're gonna be on our way out to the street, make a nice walk around the block. I'm on my way. I'm on my way, and I won't turn back. I'm on my way, and I won't take back. I'm on my way, and I won't turn back. I'm on my way, and I won't.